Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of the Bench Mob ENT podcast, the best sports podcast in New Jersey. We got a special guest with us today, Brandon Scoop B. Robinson of Scoop B Radio in the building. I would like to say he's similar to me to like Bron. Bron is 74 years old, still doing it. <laughs> Scoop B has been doing it since six years old and is still elite at it. Scoop B, how are you doing today? Bench mob, man, I'm doing good, brother. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to make this work, and um, I'm, I'm glad to sit down with you and, 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 and talk hoops. We got a lot of friends in common, so I know you come highly recommended. I appreciate it. So I want to start with this. I mentioned six years old, right? And for those that's watching this, YouTube, subscribe, rate us five stars on all streaming platforms. Now that we got that out the way. What was your first introduction of the sports and entertainment industry that inspired you to actually want to do it for a career? Um, a series of things. So, you know, before I started in the radio and, and TV space um, at 12 years old with the Nets, at six years old, I was ringing a cash register uh, in my family's sneaker store and as well as our shoe store uh, in Harlem on 25th Street. And, um, you know, we, we owned a, we were the only black owned athletes for the New York State. Um, and so, you know, we would have sneaker releases, whether that was, you know, Dominique Wilkins and Bud Webb and um, Mike, T well, those two doing their, their their sneaker releases as well as Akeem Olajuwon. But then, you know, the Wayans brothers shopping in the store, Mike Tyson shopping in the store, LL Cool J shopping in the store. So I, that was where I really got comfortable around around athletes. And then, you know, the, the men's shoe store that we owned called Men's Walkers um, in, in Harlem. You know, we, we um, Dizzy Gillespie would, would shop in the store and, and kick it with my uncle who ran the store as well as Paul Mooney. That was kind of my introduction to being around athletes and celebrities. And I also had an uncle who ran a basketball league uh, in Harlem called Citywide. And uh, anybody who came came out of New York City at that time played in Citywide. So you had Kenny Smith, you had Dredrick Irving, Kyrie's dad, uh, Ross Strickland, Mark Jackson, Jason Williams. Some of those guys, they, 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 um, they came out of when they were in high school, were playing in that basketball league. And I used to go to work with my uncle and just watch his interaction with basketball and his interaction with grassroots basketball with the Knicks, the, the Sprite Junior Knicks League and all of that stuff. And just seeing how he was respected in the field, uh, it, it made me it made me feel like I was a part of something. And I think the icing right. on the cake was watching Michael and the Bulls in 91 at six years old. And I was hooked ever since during the NBA and NBC era of basketball. Hey, that sounds like a a great story, a, a storybook. Like you couldn't have made it up any other way. You were literally, some would say, born to do this from from yeah. birth to be surrounded by all of this great talent from athletes to musicians to be around them and to see your family around them and how they interacted and how they handled themselves with. Born to do it, pretty much. That might be the title of the episode right there. Born to do it. <laughs> That's how yeah. it is. Living for you, my purpose. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. for you, right? You mentioned we just talked about from six over in Harlem, 12, working with the Nets radio at the time. What keeps you inspired? What keeps you going at this point to say, I'm going to still do what I love and tell these stories from different people from all walks of life? There was never a plan B. You know, I've, I've heard people say, well, if this doesn't work out, then what? There was never a plan B. I think when you shift um, different things and you, you, you say, well, if I don't do this, then I'm going to do this, you give too many options. Um, and I think for me, you know, there, there's been times where I question it, where I wanted to quit. Um, I, I remember, you know, while having that great experience as a, as a young kid, uh, and then, you know, from the sneaker store to shoe store to, you know, hosting Net Slam and Planet, which was executive produced by Chris Carino, the voice of the Nets, and I hosted it with Evan Roberts of WFAN, and and he was a kid prodigy as well as as well as former Net Albert King. There was a point, you know, when I graduated college and grad school as well, where you know I was living in my grandmother's basement and uh, was freelancing at about twelve different publications at the time. Was living in her basement, making trying to get the rent paid. Uh, had a double door fridge where the freezer side operated as a fridge. The refrigerator side didn't work. Had a George Foreman grill, uh, microwave, crock pot, no oven uh, in that basement. And I'm like, why the hell am I doing this? And it, it was the passion, you know, the same Brendan at six years old who watched Michael and the Bulls do their thing. It's the 
thank Brandon now who, who's watched Michael pass the torch on to Tim Duncan and Shaq and Kobe and Allen Iverson to LeBron and, 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 and Anthony Edwards and, and others in the current NBA. So I think the passion, you know, even if I wasn't working in basketball, I'd still be watching it. I'd still be getting phone calls. So I think, you know, living within my purpose, the alignment with that has kept me in the game and, and, and still going. I think that's oftentimes something that people don't really pay attention to of not having a plan B. Like you said, it's too many options. So you, hey, if this fails, so what? I got this behind me and I try this. If this doesn't work, you don't really put your full best foot forward per se when you feel like, all right, I got a bunch of these different options. I got a bunch of these different solutions. Same thing, like I'm sure you've dealt with this before when you ask a female what you want to eat you can't give her too many options it's got to be one or two and, and that's it we go with it from there for you right um being in this space do you feel the way basketball is being consumed and produced now you know print broadcasting digital media etc do you feel it's in a good space right now it's in an interesting space it's in a space that's morphing um, it it kind of reminds me of um, probably 1999 when music was being downloaded on Napster and the government and, and just the record labels hadn't regulated it yet. And we're like in the pre-iTunes, Netflix, uh, Spotify stage of, of sports. And I think that <clears throat> the test of time will not be about networks as much as it will be brands and established names uh, and followings that go with that. And I think that consistency will dictate that. I also think that while I mentioned that being the mode, I think the juxtaposition also lands on where we were in 2008 um, when the, when the banks collapsed and Obama and John McCain were running for office um, where newspapers were becoming obsolete and digital media and its first iteration with Twitter uh, and online publications uh, was a thing. And I think I think we're somewhere between 99 and 2008 right now. And I think that the thing is you have to cipher through the, the, the NBA Centels versus the Dunk Centrals. Like you have to con con consistently, you know, just um, – you have to scroll, but but use your mind uh, when you when you um, when you're making decisions on what you you choose to consult because there's so much out there. And I think at the end of the day, everybody has their preference. Um, but I, I think I think ultimately it comes down to um, the, the the reason why you you subscribe to who's doing their thing and and why you like them and what their story and their origin is. We send that in our chat weekly the NBA Centel tweets and how if you don't read it, it's been some of the major networks. ESPN has been caught with NBA Centel a couple of times. So, Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I actually know NBA Centel. And um, we, uh, we uh, I, I will say um, that as much as they do put out very questionable stuff, I have had conversations with the guy who owns the account more recently just about content creation uh -huh. and how to turn that into something credible. So um, I, I think, again, everybody has a voice is how you use it. And I think if you look at um, the the origins of Centel, they're really not new. If you if you if you if you go back pre dot com and pre apps era. The uh -huh. Onion existed. Do you remember The Onion? Yeah, I remember The Onion. Satire. Satire exists. But I think, unfortunately, people's attention spans are shorter. A thousand percent. A thousand percent for sure. Um, on the specifically, when we see some of these sports shows, right? Um, do you feel like the art of journalism is kind of being devalued in a sense when you see people like Zach Lowe, for example, get fired and we see more so what's being promoted are the hot takes and the debates. Do you feel journalism is being devalued? 
You know, I had this conversation with a mentor of mine uh, recently. Um, and I said to this particular person that I feel like people read less and, and they push back on that and they said, they don't read less. You just have to adjust to people's reading styles. And I feel like if you got something hot, people are going to read it. And if it's something that's exclusive, people are going to read it. I think the issue is players are, are, unless they know you, they don't trust media. And I think players have been trained to distrust media. And there's always this um, separation of church and state or this level of, um, it's almost like the beat cop and the drug dealer on the corner having an understanding of who each other is, but them realizing that sometimes the beat cop might actually need the local drug dealer in order to foil a case. And the local drug dealer might need the cop to get him out of trouble. And it's this understanding of the cop. You can't arrest every, every person who, who makes a mistake or who does something because you may need the bigger fish later. And I think comparatively, when you look at basketball, I think that, um, the player distrusts the media, the PR departments like it because they want to control they or they they're doing their job and feeling that they can control the message in the media. And then when a media person delineates from that, they get upset. And I think that when you look at hot takes and viral media, I, I think it's a situation where the, the, the platform is changing or whatever. And I think people, or at least the media companies companies will make you think that they only want to hear voices of retired players. Um, and if you went to school to be a journalist, you got to kind of acclimate yourself to not only get along with the retired player, the former player, you also have to get along with your journalists, your, your, your fellow journalists, um, and, and also have to make enough noise that people want to hire you. And if you don't, then you got to create your own platform because nobody wants to hire. No longer are networks just pre-making journalists like you got to be like the independent artist that gets signed to dev jam unless you have a name or you have a buzz they're not going to touch you it's funny you mentioned that because i wanted to ask is is that what you just said about media and networks not wanting to unless you like you said independent and you hot you get signed by def jam is that why you kind of went towards your own space of entrepreneurship of your own creating your own network was that part of the inspiration for Scoop B Radio and Scoop B? Well, for me, you know, I, I started my foundations in radio as a kid and then um, re-entered the space after going to college, grad school, uh, and living a life. I feel like I entered a different space where there's multiple slashes. I think the advantage that I have in a digital space is the pre-existing relationships that I've had from childhood to now. Um, I, I tried to go about it the traditional way um, and I don't think it was as well received uh, with older people um, as well as my own peers. I think I'm in a lane of my own. Uh, I have done the network route. I was at Valley Sports Network for two and a half years as their lead NBA insider um, until you know the layoffs happened about a year ago. And so I had Scoopy Radio moving since 2015 uh, with my business mm -hmm. partner and even when I was at a, a, a previous publication like Heavy.com, I still ran interviews and in, in, through, you know, Scoopy Radio. You know, Scoopy Radio is, is now a full service media company and has been in existence since 2015, um, you know, tr fully trademarked. Um, and, and, and I've invested my own time, money um, and resources into building it and, you know, have taken partnerships with other companies. but. You know, when I got out of college, I, I wanted to do it the traditional way like everybody else. But I realized, I, I not even realized, I, I made a decision to, 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 to not chase television, but to chase social media. And um, because of social media, I'll say specifically when we were all um, on lockdown during the height of the pandemic in 2020, I, I kicked it into overdrive. Whether that was, you know, sit down interviews with a Mark Cuban or Clarissa Fields or um, Elisa Ann or, 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 you know, just a myriad of other people. Um, and then, you know, the, the majors came calling. So, you know, I'm in a situation, you know, over the last year where now I haven't been in a network, but I still, you know, get booked to, to appear on television, uh, like at major networks and, 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 and make it happen. I just think we're in a space right now where, um, election time, as well as just people being very name, uh, 
snobby uh, that, you know, my name hasn't been called, but I, I, I have taken meetings and I think, you know, something will come pretty soon, but I don't just jump at every opportunity just thrown just because it's a major network, uh, you know, approaching me. I think that's a good approach and mindset. Um, like you said, not just jumping at every opportunity and you've been in it for a minute to know what's a good opportunity. You know how to create your own space. You have, like you said, it's been from 2015 and I was doing my research. An old word for some of those that's watching that don't know your Rolodex. If you had a Rolodex is deep. A lot of a lot of relationships, a lot of people that you have connected with, which I think is correct me if I'm wrong, in this space and probably in life in general, the relationships and the networking is probably the most important aspect of your growth. I would agree. I, I, I'll take it back to just something humorous. I, I was on a date Friday and um, was got a, a text from. Uh, a friend of mine showed me that that argument, or at least on TV, it appeared to be an argument with Sam Mitchell and Chris Miles. And I know both of them, you know. Um, I was first like, I'm going to leave it alone. Then I got up Saturday and I'm seeing like, this thing is going crazy. So I picked up the phone and I called Sam Mitchell. And um, he, 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 he sent me the voicemail. He's like, I'll call you back. So he was actually doing radio on Sirius that Saturday morning. Uh -huh. He's like, "School, what's up?" I said, "Man, you know what the hell I want to know." He fell out laughing. He goes, "Yo, we were playing." I was, so I was like, "Yo, let me get a let me get a quote." So he gave me a quote. I tweeted it, and I knew it was going to do what he needed to do. And then I called Chris Miles. I called him, and then he didn't answer. And then I maybe called him an hour later, and I was actually at my college homecoming at a football game. Uh -huh. and um, he was like, he didn't have my number saved. He was like, man, I thought you was a bill collector. And he, and he gave me a quote. And, um, you know, it, it moved on the internet the way it needed to move. I think, you know, having those relationships, just traveling the world, being in, in those circles and doing what you need to do and, and establish that. And that's just one example of just, you know, randomness. I, I'll tell you this. I talk about 2020 really feeling motivated during the height of the pandemic, I remember when, you know, the NBA shut down, uh, when, you know, COVID was rampant and people were figuring a lot of things out. And um, I was living in, a, I was in a different tax bracket. I was living with roommates and um, I was feeling inspired. I picked up the phone and I called Shaq. I was on my way. I was in a, I was in, I was in an Uber. I had my, 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 my uh, laundry in, a, in, a, in, a, in the trunk of an Uber headed to the laundromat. And I was texting Shaq. And I was like, yo, I really want to get you on my podcast. To, he was like, when do you want to do it? And I said, uh, let's do it in a couple of days. And he FaceTimed me the next day. I was like, yo, we got to do this on the phone. He was like, all right, bet. So we recorded it. And the numbers were crazy. And I feel like people were home and reading more and watching more. It was the perfect opportunity. And I just remember that in it was Shaq inspiring me to keep or, or wanting to do that sit down interview with Shaq inspiring me to want to do more I mean we talked about everything at that point Tom Brady had just signed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and I asked him what he thought about that and I remember Fox News picked it up then we talked about his beef with his his beef with David Robinson and and he told the whole story behind that and I just remember there were just a series of just different questions like every single question I asked them hit the blogs and I'm like yo I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep going with this and you know my my whether it was Instagram lives with people whether it was me writing different things me calling Mark Cuban and like yo do you want to do this yeah I remember Skip Bayless you know took a quote from something Stefan Marbury said on my pod and he tweeted it mentioned my name and, and talked about it on Undisputed like I just was motivated and, and that was 2020 that was like coming off the heels of like if, if the pandemic and everybody sitting down was like February, March, I closed 2019 with the report about Kyrie Irving's sh uh, shoulder. And that was talked about on local news and then national news and more. And then I'm coming off that and starting 2020 with, you know, the, or, or at least the, 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 the first quarter of 2020 with interviews with Shaq, Stephon Marbury, um, Mark Cuban, Kendrick Perkins, Clarissa Shields, I just kept going. And, you know, the, the timing is, is everything. This was all during the election time. And, you know, then going into the new year, 2021, 
you know, I got a call from Valley Sports. I, I, I left heavy.com back in, I think, January or February of, of 2021. And then uh, I made the announcement, like, f- the last day of, of Black History Month, February 28th, I get a call March 1st from uh, Bally. And, you know, they, they were interested in me. And all that hard work, sitting in the house and making things happen, it carried over from from 2021 of, 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 the, of, of uh, March of 2021 all the way until... You know, I left September 9th, 2023, and, you know, still my, use Swoopy Radio, doing interviews with Jesse Jackson and a myriad of other people, but still had the job, still had the brand, and the brand is what's carrying me even now. Hard work pays off that old adage. Just like you said, it's only a matter of time before something else comes about. It's election time and all that, but the work that you put in, it'll happen sooner than later. You mentioned the brand aspect. How did the name Scoop B come about? It started in my childhood um, with the Nets. Um, I had a, the show that I had with the Nets was called Net Slam and Planet. Um, it was on AM radio. Um, first year was 1660 AM Oswald Radio, which broadcast out of the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City. And then the second year it was on the now defunct 620 AM 101 Sports. We actually did the broadcast of the show. Uh, from the Nets practice facility then in East Rutherford, New Jersey. And what happened was um, I just would be in the locker room pregame, just having conversations between, you know, the the, the home team locker room, the Nets, and, and uh, the visitors locker room. So, you know, I'd be in the locker room with the late Dikembe Mutombo in the visitors locker room. I'd be in there with um, uh, Allen Iverson, uh, a very young rookie named Tim Duncan. This was 97. Uh, and then on the net side, you know, in there with Kendall Gill and Jason Williams and Scott Burrell, uh, Sam Cassell, Stephon Marbury, all those guys. I'd be sharing spaces even with Woj. My first year with the Nets in 97 was Woj's first year covering the Nets in 97 with the Bergen record. I'd be in the visitor's locker room with Stephen A. Smith when he was covering the Sixers for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And so I just would get the pulse of what was going on, sights and sounds and things I would hear. And then when I would do my show on Saturday mornings with the Nets, I would talk about the things I would hear and see in the locker room. And so the host of the show, the main host, her name was Lynn. Will- her name is Lynn Wilson. She said, you know, every rate has a nickname. I'm going to call you Scoop B. And I took it and ran with it. It stuck through high school. I had a column in the newspaper called Scoop B's NBA B. Uh, I still, even after my show ended after two years, would still come back to Nets games and do interviews and, you know, I took that on the road when I went away to college in, in Pennsylvania, you know, the, the RA would ask me, Hey, the door to say do you want your name i said no put scoop b and then it kind of just stuck where you know everybody on campus was calling me school that's a great story right there shout out to lynn for giving you the name like you said <laughs> the brand bigger than everything i want to get into some nba talk um of course one day hopefully maybe we have you on again and we can go deeper into the nba talk but i wanted to get that background on there before some of our viewers that don't know who Scoop B is for whatever reason, but somebody that's watching this that want to go that route of journalism to know what your story was. You are from the tri-state area. You lived in Jersey. You lived in New York. Start with the Eastern Conference. The Knicks get cat. They got Jalen Brunson still, OG, Mikel Bridges. Is this the year that the Knicks finally get it done? Um, they they have the pieces in place to, to make it happen, but um, I, I think there are ebbs and flows of, of the NBA season where you know someone could be the presumptive favorite, and then things happen. Um, I think health is going to be uh, a thing uh, that that that's going to propel them. Um, they comparatively, in the same way, when you look at Philadelphia and some of the pieces that are there, I think it's it's for the taking. But I, I still think to be the champs, you got to beat the champs, and the Boston Celtics are still the reigning Eastern Conference champs and the reigning NBA champions. And so I think that the, the Knicks um, got better, but I still have some questions as far as the center position and what Mitchell Robinson is going to be um, come new year. And um, I also have questions just about um, a guard and another small forward uh, needed in the tuck uh, and, and, and reserve roles. Like I was really looking for as, as much as Dante DiVincenzo you know, I think it will, will be in Minnesota and be inspired and move on to greener pastures. I was really looking forward to seeing him have a a, um, a repeat this year along with Bogdanovich uh, in, in, in New York. 
Um, but, you know, the Knicks had other plans. As far as Cat being there, I definitely think that that helps. I think that Cat helps um, is, a be- is a better fit in that Knicks system alongside Brunson because when Julius was playing, Julius to me has always been a blue-collar LeBron. He's both dominant getting to the basket, and I think that's a better fit in Minnesota alongside Mike Conley Jr., who can adapt off of um, both Edwards and Julius Randle uh, with the ball in his hand. I just think that he's a better fit with Nas Reed as well as um, as well as Gobert already in Minnesota. But I think for the Knicks, a cat fits them on screening rolls uh, and spreading uh, the defender on the opposing team to guard, to guard him out in the three-point line um, and, and also still causing uh, double-team uh, fits uh, at the three-point line. Um, so I, I think the Knicks are definitely in the conversation, but I still think that the Sixers, as well as the Boston Celtics, are, are, are two teams that may have something to say about that. I agree. I had Sixers and Celtics still above them. I don't know if you had a chance or if you saw, but I'm pretty sure you are because you're locked in. The reports that came out of Embiid saying, I'm probably never playing back-to-back games ever again in my career. Is that a concern to you with him coming out saying that? No. Um, Ramona Shelburne uh, reported that in, in conversation with uh, the one in Sixers, uh, big man Joel Embiid. I, I, I mean, being around that team over the last three or four or five years, um, you know, I would often look at uh, scouting reports, day of games, and, you know, it, it, he was questionable or, or at, at game time, his availability would change. I'm glad that he just came out and said what it was. And I think that self-preservation is a thing. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I think one of the most sneaky um, but effective moves that the Philadelphia 76ers made uh, this offseason uh, was in bringing in Andre Drummond, who was on that team uh, with Embiid and with Ben Simmons when Simmons was going through his issues with head, former head coach Doc Rivers and, you know, Embiid was, was out due to injury at times. And I think that um, – Drummond fits them uh, in games where Embiid won't play. And I think if you're a fantasy owner, uh, Drummond should definitely be on your radar as a utility uh, three, four, five man. Um, But I also um, think that, you know, there was an unexpected uh, emergence of Kelly Oubre last season at playing at the four position. Uh, I think Tyrese Maxey, uh, worked wonders for that team, even in the playoffs uh, last season. Uh, and I think the addition of Paul George will work wonders. Uh, I do have some questions about Paul George specifically, just mentally, uh, because of some things that I know that, that are, are for me to speak on. But I, I think that when you look at, the, number one, him being from L.A. and making a cross trip, cross trip, cross country trip to, to the East Coast and, and playing during the season in Philadelphia, um, he's a name, um, but I, I want to see him be successful and to, sh- to, to, to shut up critics uh, specifically because, um, you know, the Clippers were an ideal situation over the last couple of years to get it done. And he's gotten into another position in Philly where he's able to do the same thing. Time will tell. But I think the East Coast is just that competitive. And B really won me over last season, particularly when he did that alley-oop and then landed awkwardly on his knee and still competed. You know, you can say what you want about him, but he showed you twice last season, then in the playoffs, and even when that game against the Golden State Warriors where he hurt his knee, that he was dedicated. And I think you got to rest that body for the, for the big dance uh, come, come the spring and summertime. That's literally what I said. I was saying to my boys, I said it on TikTok. And B coming out and saying that, I think obviously if you're a fan, you don't like that because I, he might not play this back-to-back and I want to see him play. But outside of that, and B main goal, Six's main goal is a championship. Mm-hmm. Healthy in the playoffs. And B, not many teams have any answers for that man. So I would like to see, I'm not a Sixers fan, but if I'm a Sixers fan, I'm rooting for this. Please, self-preservation. I want you healthy in the playoffs. No argument out of me. Looking at on the West uh, Western Conference, right? Should OKC be viewed as the favorites to win it this year, or are you seeing other teams that are better options? I think, you know, you asked me that over the summer, I give you the same answer I give you now. Um, 
Oklahoma and the Minnesota Timberwolves, to me, are, are, are the favorites in the West. Um, as far as teams that have gotten better, uh, but maybe not championship caliber teams, are, are definitely the Houston Rockets. Um, I think that even without Paul George on their roster, um, the Clippers still are going to be competitive. Um, and so, too, will the Dallas Mavericks. I think the Dallas Mavericks get overlooked because they think that or it's it's believed um, that Clay Thompson is the tail end of his career and, uh, you know, that he's no spring chicken in the eyes of many people. But I still think that, you know, Dallas has really told them a lot of the ways and uh, have a full season to play together uh, as in comparison to last season, making, you know, deadline moves to bring in Gafford. But I, I think from top to bottom, I think the Oklahoma City Thunder as well as the Minnesota Timberwolves are my favorites going into the season. And again, it, it comes down to health. I think, uh, where the Oklahoma City Thunder did themselves a great service is the fact that they brought in Alex Caruso defensively. That's going to help him and help them uh, because Josh Giddy just didn't fit from a defensive standpoint. Um, I think he's better served as an insurance policy in Chicago in case the Lonzo Ball situation does not work out. Uh, mm-hmm. But I but I do think that uh, in Oklahoma, uh, not only adding uh, Alex Caruso, but also adding Isaiah Hardstein. Uh, and, and giving him the money he wanted is definitely going to pen, benefit the, the uh, Williams brothers as well as Shea Gilgis Alexander, uh, as well as Chet Holmgren. I think in a lot of respects, Isaiah Hardstein, you, you could you could argue would be an insurance policy for uh, Chet Holmgren, but I think Holmgren and, and Isaiah are going to work well together. Um, and I and I like I like uh, I like that team. I spent a lot of time around them over the last couple of years, actually. Uh, spending a week in Oklahoma and just getting to know that team and just how close they are. And uh, Luke Dort is also another glue piece defensively that helps that team alongside of uh, Alice Caruso that I think is going to pay dividends defensively in the playoffs. I think 100% with that, and I've said it with two with them, with all the draft picks they have and the young core, because pretty much everybody on that roster are young players. They should be in that conversation, bar and hell. They should be in the conversation for years to come, kind of like on the flip side of the Celtics. Mm-hmm. They're set up to actually, you might not win every year, but you're going to be in that conversation because of Shay, Chet. Like it's both Williams brothers. It's a lot of good mm-hmm. that they have set up with that team and draft picks just in case, because you can't pay everybody. Just in case somebody ends up leaving, they have some draft picks to figure stuff out too. So. Mm-hmm. Looking at before we transition to our end of the show segment, fourth quarter show, fourth quarter segment, um, on the the Lakers front, you being within the community, the NBA community, and reporters and the insiders, what is being said? What is the belief regarding Bronny and what the Lakers possibly can do this season? Some are saying, you know, Bronny should have never came out. The Lakers with J.J. Redick, they're going to be a playing team again. What's your thoughts on the Lakers as a whole and the, the Bronny saga? I think they're in a rebuild while also trying to trying to remain relevant uh, this season. Uh, it, it's interesting because I don't think LeBron is in a situation like Kobe where he's towards the end. In this instance, the reason why Kobe was towards LeBron is who Kobe was if Kobe didn't have the injury he had. If Kobe hadn't gotten hurt in the way he did, Kobe would be in this in this groove like LeBron is in now. If you remember Kobe hurt his Achilles, the only major injury that LeBron had was uh, when he hurt his groin back in 2018, 2019. Uh, and uh, he came back and has been, you know, has been magnificent. Um, so... You know, when I look at the Lakers, they have the two-headed monster of LeBron and Anthony Davis. I just think the league has caught up to that style of basketball. Because I feel like Anthony Davis and LeBron forming in L.A. was kind of at a point where parity in the NBA was kind of being tempered, where you don't – people were – they were trying to eradicate the three-head, three-headed monster. Like, I feel like James Harden, Kyrie Irving, and Kevin Durant were like the last of the big three. And now you got maybe big twos in the league. And I think, you know, AD, LeBron, and at times Kuzma in 2020 was that three-headed monster. I think now the Lakers are are adjusting to today's younger guys. And these younger guys in the league aren't really 
fearing the Lakers. You saw that with Memphis a couple of seasons ago. Um, and then, you know, because of that, you're seeing, you know, Oklahoma and Minnesota taking their place in the West. So I think, you know, when you look at the Lakers and, and what I've heard, you know, I've, I've heard some of the same things you, you, you've expressed with has been, has been discussed on TV. But, you know, I've been around Bronny since his senior year of high school and, you know, his first year in USC. And Bronny just enjoys playing basketball. And I think the things that you want him to care about, he doesn't give a damn. And he just is enjoying playing basketball. It's a privilege to, to play in the NBA. Not everybody can make it. And, you know, I think if he stays healthy and he gets himself together, um, I think he can be a guy that can be a solid role player. Like, everybody's not going to be a star. And that's okay. You know, you look at the NBA abroad. I use this example often. P.J. Brown was one of the most durable NBA guys in the NBA, not because he was a star, but because he was coachable and he was durable. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, he played at least 10 to 15 years on multitude of teams, those heat, uh, deep playoff teams back in the 90s, the Knicks, or not the Knicks, I'm sorry, the Nets, uh, the Pelicans, the, the Hornets, um, all those teams. And I feel like not comparing Bronny to, to P.J. Brown, but um, everybody's not going to be a star. And you got to live with that. You know, favor is not fair. His last name is James and he's in there. He has a good agent that made sure that no other teams picked him. And uh, I think winning will shut everybody up. But I, I think Bronny is in a situation where the expectations of Bronny remind me so much of Lonzo Ball over mm. specifically coming out of high school, not so much Lonzo going to the NBA. And we had to retemper those expectations of Lonzo Ball because Everybody was looking at him to be the next Jason Kidd. And Lonzo Ball, to me, coming out the gate his first few years, or I'll, I'll say during his time in New Orleans, I think at that age was a better defender than LeBron. Um, excuse me, a better defender than Jason Kidd. Uh -huh. I, think, I think him going to Chicago, that was supposed to be the chef's kiss, playing alongside you know, Levine and, 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 and DeRozan and, and Vucevic and all those other guys. And I think when you look at Bronny, comparatively, he's recovering from a heart. Within a year, year and a half's time, a heart condition, going to college and then getting drafted. That's a lot of storylines in one for some for a young guy who's not even 21 yet. And so I, I would just encourage him to, to endure, to, to stand the test of time and just make your own mark. But I think there's pressure because of who his father is, and I think you just gotta go to go through the go through the go through the grind. I think the thing that gives me hope and anybody that paid attention when Bronny got drafted, he literally said what you said in regards of, "I'm not trying to be a superstar. I'm really coming in here to play my role." I look up to players like a Drew Holiday, a Derek. Mm -hmm. So he has the mindset already, like, "Hey, I'm trying to just be in the league." do what i'm supposed to do and those players typically like you said that's a 10 15 year career right there no easily, no easily. and my cousin uh brevin knight he's talked about it like yo that's your cousin yes sir that's my dude yes sir that's that's my uh, cousin my my mom don't get married her last name night okay yeah so whole whole thing um he talks about it, he's like i came in the league to be a pro and I just was trying to get he was just I'm trying to get to the 10 years so I can get that insurance and the way that you do it is you play your role in the summertime if you want to go do your thing that's when you get to play your game but once you're in the league if they need you to be the best defender that's what you're going to be if I need you to be a facilitator that's what you're going to be if you want to stay if if you want to stay not every like you said not everybody comes in the league as broad a lot of players have to be able to play their role you mentioned the Bulls. Speaking of the Bulls, these two players, who do you think more than likely will be traded? Zach Levine, who has been in conversations for the last couple of years, or Brandon Ingram, who actually was in conversations and they couldn't get anything to happen during the summertime. Which of these two do you think actually will be traded before the deadline? Zach Levine. I think Zach, too. Um, I think B.I. ends up staying and they may figure something out in the offseason. Last question that I have to ask for you, best advice from a mentor that you have received? Write how you talk, not how you think people want to hear you talk. Mm, I like that. That's good. Fourth quarter segment, in and off the show, a couple of fun questions. 
what borough to you has the best food? Manhattan. Um, yeah, Manhattan. Manhattan or Brooklyn? Manhattan or Brooklyn, okay. One meal that you could eat and never get tired of? Sushi. Oh, okay. Is there a specific sushi? Um, I like California roll with real crab meat and avocado in it. Mm. Um, shrimp tempura is good. Um, sweet potato, sweet potato roll is good. Um, and more recently, I, I really like um, salmon rolls with the avocado. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Me and my wife That's just nice. got on it probably within like the last two months. And since we tried it, legit. Babe, what you want to eat? I kind of want to eat sushi. Like, yep. For sure. Starting five, being that you are the curator of culture, you are a lover of fashion, music. If you can give me your favorite five fashionable NBA athletes. Allen Iverson, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Kyle Kuzma, Russell Westbrook. Um, LeBron James. Solid list. If someone asked you, what is hip hop? What albums would you tell them to go listen to? Um, the Purple Tape. Um, Reasonable Doubt. Fuji's The Score. Um, anything Outcast. And Snoop Dogg's first album. Okay. Last question. Again, we thank you for hopping on, taking time out of your schedule to hop on with us. The last question before we end off this episode, top five most impactful athletes from the Jersey, New York area. You can choose Jersey, New York. You can combine it. But for you, who do you feel are the top five most impactful athletes? Um. Oh. Ross Strickland at the point. Stephon Marbury at the two. Shaq at the center position. Um. Are we going by position or just names? You can just go names. All right, so <laughs> I put Kyrie as the fourth guy. Um, and at the five or the fifth spot, um, Bernard King. Oh, I like that pick. A lot of people don't bring up Bernard King name anymore. I like I like that pick. Um, you already know the vibes, though. If you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. Bench mob, we out. Peace.